Joe and Mary Beth Tinning lived in this modest house in upstate New York. They had two beautiful children, Joseph, two, and Barbara, four years old. They had been married for six years when Mary Beth gave birth to their third child, Jennifer. Jennifer never left the hospital. She was diagnosed as having meningitis and lived for only eight days. Two weeks later, their son Joseph also died. The doctor said of cardiac arrest. Six weeks after that, they lost their third child, Barbara. This time, the diagnosis was Rye's syndrome. So the Tinnings moved to a new home in another part of town, thinking the change would help. Two years later, when she was 30 years old, Mary Beth gave birth to her fourth child, a healthy baby boy named Timothy. Then, tragedy struck again, and just three weeks after his birth, Timothy was dead. The diagnosis was sudden infant death syndrome. Within a year and a half, the Tinnings had buried four children. It was Mother's Day and Mary Beth had called me. She said to me, today Joe and I are going to the cemetery, would you like to go? And when we got there, I sort of started counting the graves. It just really upset me. And of course, she gets down on the ground. She was clearing, you know, the grass and making sure all the names were clear. And I had said to her, Mary Beth, God bless you after losing this many children. And you're still sane. I, you know, I just couldn't imagine myself going through something like that. A year and a half later, Mary Beth gave birth to another boy named Nathan. Five months later, she brought Nathan, blue and unconscious, to the St. Clair's emergency room. He never regained consciousness. This time, the cause of death was cited as acute pulmonary edema. Mary Beth had now lost five children in three years. Some doctors were convinced that her children were victims of some rare genetic disorder, something they called a death gene. Three years passed, and Mary Beth remained childless. So the Tinnings decided to adopt a baby boy they named Michael. Mary Beth explained to friends that she wanted another child because she said, I'm a woman, and that's what women are supposed to do. Mary Beth continued to have her own children. She gave birth to her sixth child, Mary Frances. Mary Frances died in less than a year. The diagnosis was sudden infant death syndrome. Jonathan Tenning was born in November of 1979. Five months later, he was dead. Doctors said of cardiac arrest. Jonathan was the seventh child to die. But Michael, the adopted son, was still alive. He was two and a half years old and seemed to be the only child to survive the Tinning family curse. Until, on the morning of March 2nd, 1981, he was rushed lifeless into the emergency ward. Something was obviously wrong. Unlike his brothers and sisters, Michael was not the Tinning's biological child. His death could not be explained away by a genetic flaw. After Michael's death, neighbors and some doctors flooded the child abuse hotline with phone calls demanding an investigation of Mary Beth Tinning. But the autopsy report cited the cause of death as acute pneumonia. Since this was a natural cause of death, it ruled out any suspicion of homicide. To escape the suspicions of their neighbors, the Tinnings moved again. Four years passed. Then, unexpectedly, at the age of 42, 
Mary Beth became pregnant again. She says to me, Sue, I have something to tell you. So I said, well, Mary Beth, well, you know, what do you have to tell me that's so important? So she says to me, I'm pregnant. She says, don't be mad at me. And I said, Mary Beth, why would I be mad? You know, I'm very excited. This must have been meant to be. Now you're going to have the child, and maybe this time nothing, you know, it'll be healthy. And that was it. She ended it, and she says, okay, now I'm going home. On August 22, 1985, Mary Beth's ninth child, Tammy Lynn, was born. Mary Beth seemed to be very good with her. She would hold her and hug her. She seemed to be a great, great mother as far as what I could see. Four months went by and she seemed perfectly healthy. It was near Christmas time. Mary Beth comes out on the front porch. Now again, I say it was cold out, it was snowing, and she says, uh, Sue, you have to come here, I have to talk to you. I have something very important to tell you. So, of course, after I got done doing what I had to do, I went over, went up on the porch, and all she did was grab a hold of me and hug me and say, Tammy died last night. I received a telephone call from the chief of police of Schenectady, New York. He asked me if it were possible for nine babies in one family to die of natural causes. I told him, no, it didn't seem possible to me, and I asked him to send me the case records on all nine children. When I looked at the medical records, I found that the doctors were attributing all of these deaths to a genetic problem in the family. When children with genetic disease die, they die slowly. They get symptoms, they get sick. They die more like a fan that gradually comes to a stop. Natural death is a process. It isn't unexpected and sudden, usually. In addition, there was an adopted baby, Michael. Nothing genetically the same as the parents. And suddenly, at three years of age, that baby died under similar circumstances as, as the other children. The concept that the cause of death was inherited was clearly wrong. The other thing I noted was that the only person with the babies when they died was the mother. One baby, Nathan, died in the car on the way to the hospital. Many of the babies were blue when they were seen at the hospital. Sid's babies looked perfectly healthy. When a baby that's been previously healthy turns blue and then dies, it means there's some kind of obstruction to their ability to breathe, some kind of suffocation. I told the police that the Tinning children had died of homicidal asphyxia. After 14 years and nine deaths, the police finally had enough evidence to confront Mary Beth Tinning. They brought her in for questioning. She uh, said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. She denied it. And then uh, finally, you know, when I, when I confronted her that we had medical evidence that it was a homicide, that, en that enough children had died as a result of what she had been doing, uh, she, she said, uh, I killed my children. Mary Beth confessed to killing three of her children, Timothy, Nathan, and Tammy Lynn. She talked about how she had killed Tammy Lynn. I finally used the pillow from my bed and put it over her head. I held it until she stopped crying. I didn't mean to hurt her. I just wanted her to stop crying. Mary Beth was found guilty of murder. She was given a sentence of 20 years to life in prison. She liked the attention of people feeling sorry for her because she had lost her children. She's an example of what we call the Munchausen by proxy syndrome, in which a parent uses or harms a child to get attention. Sometimes the child dies. In the Mary Beth Tinning case, nine children died. Some cases of this mental disorder have been actually documented by concealed video cameras. 
In this videotape, a father is seen sitting in a hospital room with his baby. He looks around and sees no one else is present. He then gets up and lies on top of the baby. The baby struggles to get free. Suddenly, the father gets up and leaves the room. If that father had stayed on the baby a little bit longer, the baby may have died. An autopsy would have shown no abnormalities. It's most likely the cause of death would have been certified as sudden infant death syndrome. When I see a battered child on the autopsy table, sometimes the whole body covered with black and blue marks, sometimes a brain injury, with indications of prior beatings over a period of time, and realize the suffering that the child had gone through and that being on the autopsy table is the first piece the child has had. The child tells me that society has failed to protect it. I have to speak for the child. I have to document what went wrong. I have to document the injuries. I have to ensure that whoever did it isn't going to harm other children. I have to ensure that the social agencies, the police, the protective services, the relatives know that they are their brother's keepers.